Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hopefully, I won't be as controversial as my reputation. An unfair comment has just preceded me. Um, having listened to Roger's talk at the Wildlife Congress, um, I shot my mouth off and said, well, what about the legal aspects of this? And, of course, I was pounced on and said, well, give a talk. Tell us all about it. So Melissa and I got together and um, thought we'll unpack very briefly what we're up against. What are the, this talk, what are we going to embrace? Okay. What is the international legal framework? What, do we, what about South Africa? We've got very good laws here. How does it all fit in? I might give you some insights into provisions of the, the law in Far East. Not very much because that's not the focus. And then what to next? And having just heard Roger's announcement by the, the, the National Minister and what South Africans' um, stance on the matter, well, what to next is um, I haven't a clue. It's a conclusion up front. The scenario. Here we've got... A saucer rhino here represented by a highly, highly skilled um, professional hunter from Vietnam. The horns get um, collected from this legal acquisition, then put into some mechanism where it's sold. It's been beneficiated in a highly technical laboratory, sold. Um, the hopes is that the poaching rate will go down and our numbers of rhinos will go up. That's how I see Roger's talk. I'm not going to comment on that. That's the starting point. Well, the first thing we do in the legal fraternity, we say, well, what is the shortcut? How can we give Roger the advice or all of you the advice in the quickest way possible with the least risk to ourselves? So the first stop of call is wiki answers. <laughs> And I did just that. Can you sell, legally sell rhino horn? And the answer was the most popular one. It's illegal to sell rhino horn. Note the spelling. There are pretty stiff penalties trying to do this. So why can't you sell a rhino horn? Because it's illegal, duh. <laughs> so there's a lot of law out there. And obviously, we've got um, people out there that are insightful into the problem and be able to advise us. Let's start uh, seriously with CITES. Okay? The Convention of um, International Trade of Endangered Species, this is where the focus is, and we are bound to apply the provisions of this convention. Very importantly, no trade in appendices 1, 2, and 3 except in accordance with the provisions of CITES, Article 2, for those people who want to track us. Okay. But the most important thing, white rhino, which is the proposal, is Appendix 1. It's not Appendix 2 or 3. It is right at the top of protection in CITES, except for live sale of rhino and trophy animals collected by our highly skilled um, hunters. And they, those, trophy and, uh, those trophy horns can't go into the commercial trade. They are genuine trophies. Then <clears throat> the, the CITES also says any decisions around this has to go, be referred to the scientific authority of the, the country, and they have to do a non-detrimental finding. So, yes, we've got a proposal, but there's some work to be done to convince CITES. Okay? And then, of course... The legally obtained horns have to be verified, and Roger, Roger um, gave us some insights into that. The CITES-South African law relationship, okay? CITES is in our law. It's in our Biodiversity Act very clearly, and we have CITES regulations, which I'll, I'll touch on. Okay? When you um, adopt law into, uh, CITES convention into our law, we can only go stricter. We can't lessen it. If we lessen it, we'll be in contravention of the, of the convention. If we look at the convention itself, how it's gone, well, I'm just going to pop through this because we're short of time. Um, conference and parties, 
at COP3 in 1981 said we have to prevent um, sales and trade. Okay? And then in 1987, they said, well, we've got to prohibit it. So we're getting tougher. And as we go on, things got tougher and tougher in societies by motivation by ourselves and other, other state parties. And we go all the way down to effectively a trade ban. I'm not trying to do the doom and gloom. I was warned against that yesterday. But you can see the international trend in law to say we're going down this street and not down that street which opens it up for trade. So we're up against a huge history here to convince the conference of parties otherwise. What are the... What are the steps? Richard this morning says, well, if you're going to be convincing, you have to be damn convincing because you've got to convince two-thirds of the con uh, conference of parties to vote in favor of you. And then there's this 90-day um, cool-off period where other um, non-present parties can also have their say. Then to transfer from, to Appendix 2, so we can trade in the products of rhino or white rhino. Okay. There has to be sufficient management manager measures and enforcement in place. That's not only in this country. This is in the destination countries as too. So we've heard Tony about our, our enforcement here, but what about that Vietnam in, in the earlier speeches of Joe? Okay. How well are they doing? And if one looks at the Vietnamese law, it's very strict. If you look at the Japanese and Chinese law, very strict. The enforcement is a problem. And then you have to show sustainable trade, and that has to be done. Um, so the ability to enforce domestic laws to ensure sustainable trade is the question. No, I've got 10 minutes left. <laughs> right, let's look at what these, these destination countries are. And I've put Vietnam at the top because they are the red-hot topic. Going back as 1994, Vietnam said... No uh, ban to import and ban for use. And if one looks at all the other, in the other countries, they've done exactly the same. But yet the trade continues. So the enforcement issue is a problem. So there's a poor track record. Okay? When you have a poor track record, what is COP going to do? They're going to be hesitant to open up international trade. Okay, what is the possible solution? So there's always solutions. As Roger says, you put the rule enforcement here and you go around the side. Well, us as conservation ent entities can do exactly the same. Okay? The elephant trade, the ivory trade, what went down the route where if we go into trade, we can put a, a partial or complete halt to trade if they're ineffective non-compliance or there is a detrimental impact. And I think that's our avenue saying we've got a precedent here, the elephants are still present and abundant and growing and needing um, pigs' eggs to be inserted into them to stop them breeding. Maybe we can do the same thing with, with the rhinos. The South African law, my favorite. <laughs> As I mentioned, we've got the, the National Biodiversity Act. Okay? Gives effects to the international agreements. Okay? and brings into, into law CITES, okay? And the details are it gives effect to trade of live animals and hunting of trophies, or for trophies, rather, okay? The minister has to consult the scientific authority. Now, maybe I bring this in in defense um, and to mitigate Roger's in, um, angst about, about our position as CITES, but... Has the our scientific authority been consulted and have they gone through what they need to do in order to do it? Are you hearing a good yes? Okay. <laughs> okay. And the scientific authority must come out with a non detrimental finding. Okay. CITES regulations are regulations. Okay. Mirrors CITES appendices. It's automatically amended to deal with changes in CITES. It, it provides for enforcement. Okay? And if one looks at the Biodiversity Act and our CITES regulations, there's no impediment. All we need to do is to convince CITES and 
the course of South African law will follow and provide for it. I'm seeing a smile and a nod from Roger. <laughs> okay. But the one thing we haven't considered is this by prospecting. If you go and take a horn and you beneficiate it and you go and sell it or you go and treat somebody or you enhance it, you buy a prospecting. Does that mean then we have to change that? Because at the moment, okay, we can enter into prosecution. But if, we, if somebody con contravenes these regulations, and if we say, well, no, maybe you can go ahead with it, where do the royalties? How do we collect the royalties? We've got to go into uh, benefit sharing agreements with the communities and the people harvesting and using it. How are we going to manage that? So there's a little bit of homework there to do, but well worth considering. And that's the controversial thing if you hadn't, if you hadn't stumbled on that. Okay, steps required in South African law. Okay, we have to amend White Rhino and get it to at least a Appendix 2 listing. I'm nearly done. Okay, our CITES regulations maybe, maybe need to be amended if we go for the partial trade route. Okay, but we also have to do some internal stuff. We have a national moratorium on the trade of our rhino horns. We're going to have to get those norms and standards sorted. Okay, and also the norms and standards for hunting and marking um, horns. Okay, what well, about the bioprospecting regulations? Well, we're going to have to look quite carefully at those because we can't have any conflicts. So inclusion. There are no real blocks in South African law. As I said, we've got homework and housekeeping to need, need to deal with. Okay? But the most important thing in our homework, CITES needs to be convinced. And if we don't convince CITES, there's no domino effect to, into, our, into our domestic law. Okay? I heard sword nods about the non-detrimental finding. Looks like we have, have that. Okay, and that concludes my talk well within time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Quick question. Uh, Rail Lynn. Um, Andy, thanks a lot for the talk. It was very really interesting. I um, just want to ask two things. Firstly, if hypothetically uh, Roger's proposal um, is ex uh, goes through, uh, first of all, how long will it take for the, the TOPS Regulations Biodiversity Act to um, be affected by the decision that, that ideally would be taken? Uh, sorry, um, and uh, the second thing is just in terms of the bioprospecting, um, is it not that that falls outside trade? Aren't we talking about an alternative or a substitute? You're not really talking about, I mean, ideally, if that, if that uh, Uzi Vizonke liquid you had on the screen there was to convince the Vietnamese market, then we'd be, we'd be getting somewhere. But it's not, um, it's got nothing to do with CITES, I'd imagine. It's more got to do with uh, other, other aspects. Um, and also on that point, I mean, to what extent would uh, the pursuit of, sub of such substitutes help to reduce the demand um, as, as, uh, Mention other talks. Thanks. I'll answer one of those questions, um, and then I'll call a friend or ask the audience. Um, how long does it? Well, soon, soon as the the listing has changed, or there's provisions in CITES to allow us to trade, then it's how long is the length of string? Because it's in our own domestic control to change. The minister can actually allow for trade immediately. That, there's, no, there's no impediments, but there are slight conflicts that we need to polish out because you can't have norms and standards that, are, that apply throughout the country in place and then the law says you can go ahead and ignore those. It's just bad, bad, bad law. Okay, so it's how long we have to do it. Um, regulations can be changed within 90 days plus three months. So it's relatively quick. It's how quick the national minister and her department can move. I'll take the last one from Dr. George Hughes. I, I'd just like to, to uh, remind people, rather than a question, 
that, that CITES is not insurmountable. Um, the, in 1997, we lost the very request for trade by one vote. One vote. And whilst you had the, <laughs> Mr. Malema up there, I'd just like to pay, pay credit to Peter Mokaba, because Peter Mokaba uh, was then the Deputy Minister of Environment Affairs, and Peter Mokaba put the effort into bringing the whole of Africa, apart from a few cowards, uh, on the side uh, to help us get to that point, and we also made a bad mistake. We went for an open vote. We should have gone for a secret vote, because the European Union in an open vote had to vote as a bloc, and they had decided to vote against it. But the European Union members came to me afterwards and said, you bloody idiot, if you had made it, made it secret, half of us at least would have voted for you because our reputation for rhino conservation is the finest in the world and we must not be ashamed of that. We mustn't go in there with a begging bowl. We go in there and said, we've done the job on the ground. You recognize it. And the vast majority of CITES countries are not stupid and will support us if we put up a decent case. Thank you.